Praise the name of the Lord. Let's give the Lord some more praises tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, we thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for that which you will do. In Jesus' name. I want to sing a hymn tonight. I don't know if you can just find it. In times like these, we need a Savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. We want to sing that song. As we're finding the song, I just want to greet uh, Pastor Bishop McCrequin and your dear wife, to Bishop Stewart, to uh, Minister Caleb, amen, to Bishop Nunes, and those who I haven't mentioned, I greet everyone tonight, amen. You are special and you are precious, and as we have come together in this last night, praise God, I believe that the Lord can do something really wonderful for each of us in this place. I want us to just set our expectations towards the Lord. Um, I don't know where we are spiritually or how satisfied we are. Uh, maybe sometimes we come to service hoping it would be a good service for somebody else. But I want you to just recondition your mind tonight that tonight can be a great night for you. Praise the Lord. Yes, it can. It can be a great night for each of us tonight because no matter where we are, I know the Lord has somewhere to take us. No matter what station we're currently at, God has a, a place that he can take us to. And we want to pray for those who have not received the Holy Spirit, but also, man, I don't know the last time you felt God really move on you. you know, I don't know. Sometimes we have testimonies, and when we check the date on them, it was a long time ago. I don't know the last time you worshipped till your face was wet with warm tears just appreciating God. I don't know the last time you prayed and you were broken about somebody else's problem. I don't know the last time you prayed and the Holy Ghost took over your prayer and took it over into another place, into another dimension. All these things ought to be commonplace in our lives. So we get dry sometimes. Is that true? We, we can get a bit rusty Sometimes we can get a bit comfortable and a bit complacent. But I'm believing God to just usher us into a fresh experience of Him tonight. We're going to talk about Jesus. <laughs> Amen. And every time we talk about Him and every time we glorify Him and every time we magnify Him, He has a way of refreshing us. The Word of God says we can get times of refreshing. From the Who wants to be refreshed tonight? Amen. We want to be refreshed. Let's sing this hymn with me. In times like these, we need a Savior. In times like these, sometimes it gets rocky. We need an anchor. Let's go to verse 2. Let's go to verse 2. In times like these, don't we need that Bible? We need the Bible. The Bible. In times, like help us, Jesus. These. Help us, Lord. Oh, be not idle, but be fair. a savior in times like these. yes we do yes we do i have a savior thank you lord in times like these i have The solid. 
Craig, who are we talking about? This rock is Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, he's the one. Hallelujah. Glory. This rock. Oh! 
God, we exalt you. We exalt you as the rock of our salvation. We exalt your power over all the powers of the enemy. We magnify your name. We magnify your word. We magnify your promise. You're God and God alone. Father, we thank you tonight for your presence. And we do worship you. We do exalt you. We want your name to be glorified. We want your name to be exalted. Oh God, we want your name to be lifted. We want the glory to be accrued to you, Lord. Hallelujah. Have your way, Father. Have your way as we worship you. Have your way, oh God, as we decree your words tonight. And be glorified in Jesus' name. Just clap your hands for Jesus. Just clap your hands for him. All ye people, all ye people. All ye people, clap your hands to the Lord. Clap your hands to the Lord. Children, clap your hands. Adults, clap your hands to the Lord. Clap them to the Lord, to the Lord, to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now if you can, just release a shout with a voice of triumph. Release a shout with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Glory. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we bless your name. We bless your name. Hallelujah. The Lord reigns. Amen. God bless you tonight. You may be seated in God's presence. It's just so easy to worship him in this place tonight. Oh, this atmosphere makes me just want to praise him. Hallelujah. I believe in that. Praise God. I believe in that. Praise God. I, I love the word and I, I believe in it. I preach it. I teach it. But I also believe that the presence of God in a moment can do more than an hour's teaching and preaching. When the Lord is in the midst of us and he's truly magnified, what a wonder. Praise the name of the Lord. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Numbers chapter 20. Praise the Lord. I want to just take verse 8 to launch what the Lord's put in my heart for you tonight. Praise the Lord. I believe in him to help us through. Pray for me. I'm, I'm more of a teacher than a preacher. We would want God to just vindicate his word. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Why don't we just maybe stand for this verse? I won't keep you much longer standing. Praise the Lord. The Lord gives instruction to Moses here in Numbers 20, verse 8. And he says to him, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so that thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. Praise God. You may be seated tonight. Amen. Uh, it's a large passage of scripture. I'd really love to take us through it line by line if we could. But this instruction comes to Moses after the children of Israel, for the second time of asking, are chiding him. And we see in Exodus 17, the first incident where the children of Israel got thirsty. They were really nervous about getting out of Egypt and then being brought into a wilderness. You know, it just, it just didn't feel right that they got this great deliverance, but that they were landed in a wilderness and then they got to a point where it didn't look like the man who took them out in their eyes had a plan to take them forward any further and poor Moses he's not the maker of water and he didn't actually really know what he was doing or where he was going he just knew that he was depending on God for the next direction for where to take the children of Israel and it's true that leaders you know, can be called to lead, but not always know what to do next. We don't have all the answers until God really shows us what we need to do. And then we have to look back and reflect and say, well, why does God allow us to get to places of dryness? Why does he allow us to get to places where we don't have answers? And so we learn so much from the lives of the children of Israel. And you see in this scripture where they, they are being instructed to, 
to speak to the rock. In Exodus 17, the Lord granted Moses a commandment to strike the rock. And when they struck the, the rock, water came out. In this particular passage of scripture, Moses actually disobeys the command to speak to the rock, and instead he strikes it twice, and it lands him and Aaron in serious trouble with the Lord. And I want to speak to us tonight from Lessons on the Rock. I want to just go through some of the things that we can learn and take from this passage of Scripture. Nevertheless, as we take a step back and understand the usage of the word rock throughout the Scriptures, we know that Christ is referred to prophetically as the rock of our salvation. We go to Matthew 16. From there, you see 16 to 19 where the Lord begins to quiz his disciples, who do men say I am, and who do you say I am? Peter, we see, got top marks, you know. In a moment, he was, he was rewarded. When he got the right answer, the Lord said to him, man, flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you. This was my Father in heaven. But just two minutes later, Peter flunked <laughs> when the Lord said, I'm going to be taken away, and he said, no. And the Lord had to rebuke Satan in that situation. Uh, what I looked at there, I said, my God, in a moment, you can be a person who's inspired of God. And in the next moment, you can be someone who's got it completely wrong. Sometimes we, we are very uh, uh, unmerciful towards people because we think if they got it right once, they're going to get it right all the time. But the Lord rebuked Satan and he said, you don't really savor the things of God. He said to Satan, get behind me. Because in another version, it says you're always thinking from a human perspective. And so what that reveals is that we can be, as spiritual people, guilty of bringing a human perspective. And you can be spiritual in one moment and get it right. But the minute you start to look at things carnally, the minute you start to assess your situation just from a human perspective, you land yourself in trouble. I mean, it's so much trouble that Satan got a rebuke. You see how close the works of your flesh and your human thoughts put you in Satan's camp so quickly. And we can be people who have are, are right about the revelation about Jesus Christ. But a lot of other things we're looking at from the wrong perspective. <laughs> I'll let that one marinate just a little bit. We got the revelation about who Jesus is, but there are so many other things for which our perspective is incorrect. And so we have a rock that we can speak to. I want to talk a little bit about him. The Lord says to Peter in this passage something special. He says, you know, you're Peter and upon this rock, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And people can debate what the rock is. I think that the, the, the Roman Catholics will try to convince you that Peter is that rock. And he's, he's, the, he's the, therefore the first bishop of the church of Rome. That's a lie. It's not the truth. But they infer that from a scripture like this, you are Peter, because his name meant rock, stone. But the Lord was saying, your name is Peter? Huh? Let me tell you something. Upon this rock, what rock? The rock of the revelation of who Jesus is. I'm going to build my church on people having a right perspective about who Jesus is. And tonight, one of the fundamental things we want to put across in your spirit is really to clear your way so you can see very clearly who Jesus is. When you have an accurate picture of the Savior and what he can do, it ought to change your perspective. When you recognize the potency and the power of your God, you see, sometimes we have relegated God to the way we feel. We have relegated God to the, the, the circumstances and the situations that we've been through and we project upon God. Our understanding of who he is based on what we have experienced. Now experiences are important, but there are experiences you have not yet had. We can go for an experience where we pray for somebody and they get healed and delivered from cancer. And it shapes your perspective. 
Let me tell you something. The same person can pray for another person and they die of cancer. And, and, and some people's perspective of God does not get recovered from the last situation they went through. Some people have determined who God is by what he didn't do for them when they wanted it to happen. And we need to get into our perspective that while God is a good God, he don't work for us. We are workers together with him. One of my prayers is, Lord, I don't want to work for you and not be on your payroll. Because there's a lot of people working for Jesus and he did not employ them. They're preaching in his name. They're prophesying in his name. Some of them are even casting out devils in his name. But he said in the book of Matthew, he said, I'll say to some of you, I never knew you. So, so, so what are we chasing, really? You be careful what you're chasing. People can work miracles. The Bible says the Antichrist, that's going to be one of his main features. The Antichrist will be a miracle. If you're just impressed by miracles, you could be in trouble. This is why we need a perspective of God that is so rooted in his word. That we can identify what we are looking at. And not only that, you, you need to be on the spirit-filled, spirit-led, sound teaching. Because there is a, there's a spirit that comes from the word of God. The Bible says that, the, Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. There is something about the word of God that even when you don't understand it contextually, even when you don't understand it intellectually, the spirit of God's word can still sit upon you and sanctify you. I didn't get it as a younger person. I was going to those said, go read the book of Deuteronomy. And I'm reading the book of Deuteronomy and really it, it means the word Deuteronomy, it's a, it's a word to be repeated. I didn't get the gist of everything in the book. And you know, sometimes you reach a part of the books and it's just genealogies. And you're like, well, what am I supposed to take from this? And you're hearing stories about journeys. from, And like some of, some of the stuff don't seem to be relevant. But I, I remember reading my Bible on the train and feeling like I didn't really get anything intellectually from the text. But somehow my spirit felt fed. Somehow my, I felt like I'd eaten something. Because the words are spirit. I've come up on the sanctified people and sanctified teaching. And I appreciate God for that. Because there's something in the way the food is cooked. There's something in the way the meal is prepared. Because the man of God, the real man of God, is not just a student of the text. He is studying to show himself approved unto God. You are getting some of the chef in the food that's being prepared for you. I don't know if you, if you receive that. The Bible says that we should desire the sincere milk of the word. But where does milk come from? Come on. This is an intimate thing. Someone has to feed you. Is the person who's feeding you healthy? If they don't have a healthy relationship with God, the milk is spoiled. The nutrients that you should get to grow, you're not getting them. Because they're not eating properly. I don't just need someone teaching me and preaching to me who is a student of the text. I need someone who bows down before God. Who daily says, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Who says, give me this day, daily bread. They don't read the Bible to preach. They read to live. <laughs> Who's teaching you is important. 
So when you come up on the sanctified teaching, you, you just can't move in everything. And everything doesn't move you. Unfortunately, some, I'm a nonconformist. I'm a nonconformist. My father said to me, if you go in a place and everybody's shouting, moving, waving, and you, they're excited. He said, if you feel like you can't get in it, he said, don't try. Because there's a lot of learned behavior in church. Hello, somebody. There's a lot of copycat behavior in church. One person start running, somebody else got to start running. Be yourself. I didn't feel nothing. I'm not running. One person drop on the altar and everybody have to drop. I'm not going on. I'm going to fight you. you try, why are you trying to push me over? I don't feel nothing. Why are you tapping me on my mouth to talk in tongues? You can't give me tongues. If we stop trying to manufacture a move of God, we might actually have one. Sincerity of word. The spirit of God's word is so pure. It cleanses you. Jesus said, you are clean through the words I speak unto you. I don't just need a message that's been put well together. I need the Spirit of God to minister to me through the Word and cleanse me. The Word of God is a washing agent. It's a cleansing agent. If the Word can't wash you, I don't know what's going to make you clean. It's the Word of God that cleanses us. Paul, Peter had this revelation. And God says, upon revelation, upon a clear picture, upon a father-sent revelation, I'm going to tell you who I am and how I'm going to build my church. I was just thrown by my wife looking at her watch. Forgive me. Praise God. <laughs> I'm going to stop looking at you. Praise Jesus. Matthew eleven 27. I'm coming into something. Jesus says, all things are delivered unto me of my father. And no man knoweth the son... But the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Jesus is clearly saying, if I don't show you who I am, you ain't going to work it out. You want to burn your gums in debates, it's up to you. But it's going to take God to reveal himself to people. If it was as easy, sir, as putting a diagram together, then we'd all get it. <laughs> and that's what men have done with the doctrine. They have created human templates to try and create an understanding in a carnal mind. Well, the carnal mind can't discern the things of God. They're spiritually discerned. There are things that only Christ can truly bring revelation to you. And if you're born right, I believe you'll grow right. <laughs> if you're born of the Spirit, I believe you'll grow in the Spirit. If it's Christ who has delivered you, I believe he'll continue by his Spirit to lead you into all truth. The Spirit of God makes us teachable. So how can we be so stubborn? Jesus said, it takes a revelation from God for you to know who he is. In 1 Corinthians 10, from verse 1 to 4, and I'm just going to give you just a few more examples of how the rock was spoken about. Paul gives an example which today, you know, if, if our modern theologians was assessing Paul's writing and his assessment of the Old Testament, they would say it's not true. Because what he says here is, moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Next verse. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Some would say, how could Paul say that passing through the Red Sea was baptism unto Moses? 
Uh, if anybody came out and said that without Paul saying that, where you get that from? Paul was speaking with revelation. Some folks think that if Paul didn't say it, then it's, it, it can't be right. And some say if he said it, well, you know, Paul had issues. I don't listen to anybody who said Paul had issues. I had a very good friend who tried to send me something alluding to the fact that Paul was chauvinist. I said, I don't play with that. If you think that you know more than the Apostle Paul, I want to know which heaven you reached. Because he got to number three. I don't take lightly people throwing stones at the apostles. Until you've walked somewhere, you can't really say those types of things. But I'm just trying to show you the audacity of the revelation. Next verse, he says, and did all eat the same spiritual meat? Now, that's another thing just to consider because Jesus said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. And they died. Paul's on a different level here. Next verse. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock. Capital R. A man was in Revelation. <laughs> that followed them. You have a rock following you. A rock following you. I wish my friend Minister Clark was here back home. He used to preach this message. I couldn't preach it like him. And that rock that followed them was Christ. If you was to say that Christ was in the wilderness, how was Christ, New Testament, for these folks, how was he in the wilderness, and what business did he have following them? Thank God for revelation. <laughs> Thank God for understanding. As the children of Israel journeyed through the wilderness, the Bible says there was a rock that was following them. Paul says it was a rock, and you can see by the capitalization of the R, he's not talking about the physical rock. Hallelujah. He's talking about the spiritual rock. And as we jump back now to Numbers chapter 20, I want to show you some of the lessons that are going to help us through. Some of these things, church, I want to show you because... There are things happening around us and we sometimes, we wonder, we, we start asking questions. Is God really in that move? Is that really God at work? Are these people really people of God? I want to show you what happens uh, in Numbers 20. Numbers 20 from verse 6, it says, Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they fell upon their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spake to them, saying, verse 8, which we read earlier on, that you should take the rod and gather the assembly together, Aaron thy brother, and speak to the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. We read this earlier on. The lesson that I want to take to you from this passage here is, number one, the rock is reliable in moments of personal inadequacy. The rock is reliable in moments of personal inadequacies. When we've reached our, the limit of our resources, there is a specific posture that we should take to get answers to the problem. If we go back to the previous verse, it shows, verse 6, that they went from the presence of the assembly. Now, the assembly was complaining to them. And they used very much detail to say, this is a problem. You brought us here into the wilderness. We used to have pomegranates. We used to have all these things back here. And now look, where have you brought us to? They brought a very specific list to Moses. And guess what? They weren't wrong. No, no, their list was right. Everything that they had access to in Egypt, they couldn't get it in the wilderness. They weren't lying. I'm not saying their attitude was right. They were murmurers and complainers. But have you ever been hungry before? Have you ever followed somebody into an enterprise and all of a sudden it went south? The humanity of these people begin to show. And so what I've put here, when you're following God's instructions and you hit a dry place and when people start to complain, go back to God. Go into his presence, fall on your face because you have a rock 
for times like these. When people can present a list of what's missing and they're right, even if their attitude is wrong, they have a point. And you should not take that personally, but take it to the Lord in prayer. Sometimes in leadership, we start taking things personally. And we think that the goodness that we have done from yesteryear should excuse us from actually taking seriously the issues that we are currently facing. No amount of good deeds from years past is going to quench people's thirst when they don't have water today. And there are times that we reach dry places. There are times when it looks like everything has become predictable. And people can tell us how the service is going to go. And they can tell us who's going to preach. And every now and then we need to fall on our face and say, Lord, we need a refreshing. Lord, we need you to do something new. And I want to tell you, you have a rock for times like these. Don't take it personally. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Don't blame yourself. You, you're not God to the people. Only God can be God to them. So sometimes we need to fall on our face. God is sometimes looking at how he can keep us on our faces, especially as leaders. Because sometimes we graduate ourselves. <laughs> I heard bishops saying he doesn't understand bishops who don't worship. I, I think I've said the same thing word for word in other messages. Uh, how do you graduate beyond worship? Sometimes we, we think our accomplishments exempt us from the basics. We always going to need to worship. We don't like leaders who won't take a stand. We have many of those, but sometimes we are lacking leaders who will fall on their face before God. God has methods to keep us face down. Sometimes, saints, in the middle of that period of dryness and an answer, we get busy and build things we shouldn't build. We get busy and create solutions that we shouldn't have put there. We create things to keep people in church that don't really keep them in church. It just titillates them for a season. I think we've lived long enough and done church long enough to see how sometimes we make these moves to satisfy the young people. And we make these moves to, to make people come through the door and they still leave. In those moments of what shall we do, get down on our face before God. Let's ask the Lord to help us through. Lesson two. The rock is re a reliable resource for the masses, not a tool for self-aggrandizement. The quality of the rock is faithful even when we're disobedient. Let me take this down. Verse 9, Moses took the rod from before the Lord and as, he, as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock and said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. God didn't tell him to say that. Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Moses lifted up his hands, and with the rod, he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly. My God. And the congregation drank, and their beast also. But the Lord spoke to Moses and, and to Aaron and said, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. God is concerned with how we present him. He's concerned with how we represent him. He said to Moses, you didn't present me right. You, you didn't present me right to the people. You didn't represent me right. And actually he accuses him of unbelief. Moses, you did not believe me enough. I put here that God is concerned with how we present him, represent him. What is done in the eyes of the people either accrues glory to God or takes it away from him. When people are murmuring, when they're angry and have a point, we are better off taking it to God and talking to God rather than talking to them. The Lord said, don't talk to the people, talk to the rock. He did not ask Moses to address the congregation in the moment of their greatest need. He said, I want you to talk to me. 
There was a saying back home, it was a telephone company which cheekily said it's good to talk. They know the more you talk is the more money they make. But sometimes it's not a time for conversation. Sometimes it's not a time to consult the people. Sometimes it's not a time to take a vote. God said, talk to me. Talk to me. And I will release the solution. Moses disobeyed. They were meant to see in Moses a caring shepherd turning to God, asking him to quench their thirst. That's what they were meant to see. They were meant to see that the answer to their thirst was being solved not by the one who led them, but by the God who was leading the one who was leading them. The glory was meant to be for God. The Bible says that the wrath of man cannot reproduce the righteousness of God. When we are angry, sometimes you hear some preaching and it might seem anointed, but it's just annoying. They're annoyed. They're angry. They're hostile. But it's not the anointing. The wrath of man cannot produce the righteousness of God. Moses in his anger messed this thing up. He was not asked to address the people. How is it that the rock still gave them water? How is it? How is it that the rock still gave them water? I think this should scare churches all over. And, and I'm saying this to me as a leader too. Sometimes we can be complacent that people are still being watered. That people are still getting something from the ministry. But we have actually lived in disobedience. We have acted out in a way that was not pleasing to God. But because God cares more for his people, he will still feed them. Oh, he loves his church. And no matter how angry you are with the state of the church, Jesus still loves his church. You see in the book of Revelation, he says to most of those churches, I have a few things against you. But he loved them and he told them how to overcome. You can't love the church more than Jesus. And so he cares, he cares. He's the caring shepherd. The rock still gives water. The quality of your rock is that you don't have to always be right or have all the right methods. You don't have to be perfect to get salvation. Paul got a picture of this and he had a different attitude to most of us because he says, I don't even mind if they're preaching the gospel in pretense. The gospel is preached. Now, how could you say that? Paul was not, Paul understood that salvation was so powerful that even if the preacher was crooked, a man can be saved. You see the power of the word? Jesus was also quite relaxed. He was more relaxed than us because the disciples found another man casting out devils. It's like, he's, he's, he's not in the 12. Who's this man? You see the attitude we have sometimes, Bishop? Who does this man think he is? He's not rolling with us. How is he casting out demons? Jesus, deal with this man. What did Jesus say? He's not against us. He's for us. What revelation was that man operating in? Yeah, he didn't treat him like the sons of Sceva. They were torn up. Something was different. We sometimes can't deal with the anomalies. You know, our, our religion sometimes blinds us from seeing how God can work in things and in ways that we didn't expect. We, we got too used to principles prescribing that it can only happen this way. I think I heard it in the questionnaires yesterday about getting the Holy Ghost before being baptized in Jesus' name. Just point them to Cornelius. <laughs> Just point, it's in the Word. He weren't baptized yet. Some old apostolics told us, if you didn't get baptized in Jesus' name, you can't get the right Holy Ghost. It can't be true. Your Bible tells you it's not true. Uh-oh. We've we got to be sensitive to how God is moving. We have to be able to have so much of God that we can feel when it's the same thing. <laughs> Man, God's working on some sinners before you meet them. They're already getting dreams. You need to be in the spirit. <laughs> oh, that dream can't come from God. God's been talking to them for years. You need to be able to be sensitive. And so the view 
God can still bless us. I'm saying, Lord, have mercy upon me. Paul said, look, I, I don't want to become a castaway. I don't want to get disqualified having once preached the gospel. My messages were true. My preaching was accurate. But it's, it's possible that I can be disqualified. So where does the grace doctrine grow now? You once say, always say, what disqualification was Paul talking about? Disqualified from what? If once saved, always saved. What was Paul going to be disqualified from? He just used the word to bring these things down. The word doesn't oppose itself. The word answers itself. Jesus feeds 5,000 people regardless of the disciples' lack of preparation. He just took two fishes and five loaves and said, let's just fix this problem. God doesn't need you to be perfect to save you. God don't need you to be perfect to deliver you. God's not expecting you to get it right all the time. That's why we have a rock. We have a place that we can continually resort to. I need that rock. I'm too imperfect to do this thing on my own. I need a rock to run to. I can be right today and wrong tomorrow. I need a rock. I need a shelter. I need a hiding place. I need a place where I can confess. Say, God, help me. Help me. I've not been perfect. I've not got it right all the time. I need somewhere to go to. Church, you have a rock. Don't let nobody undermine your salvation by the last mistake you made. You have a rock. You have a God who cares for you. You have a God who fights for you. You have a God who will come to your rescue. Oh, I need to run to the end. I may have to just jump to lesson four. I, I'm not looking at my wife, but I can feel her. <laughs> Praise God. The rock is tough. The rock is righteous. But the rock is not petty. I need to talk you through this because it's a warning to me and it's a warning to all of us. After their shenanigans, after Moses does his strike in the rock, the Lord brings a conclusion to Aaron's life. Verse 24. And I, I, I look at parts of the severity of how God dealt with Aaron and his sons. You remember that? They were messing around in the tabernacle. And God just <laughs> wiped them out. And what did he say to Aaron? Don't mourn for your sons. Didn't that seem tough? Don't mourn for them. I need to tell you, there's some things that take place in church that should make us mad. Yeah, there are some abuses that have taken place in church circles. No, we, we, we shouldn't accept them. I'm quite happy to send people to prison to repent from prison. We have prison ministry. If you transgress the law, you need to face the law. If you abuse and misuse and you break the law, you should go to prison. I, I, as your pastor, I'll, I'll call the police for you. There are some abuses that we should not tolerate. The church should be a safe place. God said to Moses, Aaron, don't mourn for your sons. They, they transgressed my house. They were messing with some serious stuff. Don't mourn for them. And God says to Aaron, you're going to be, Aaron will be gathered to his people, he said to Moses. That's a nice way to say, I'm going to kill him. Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I gave unto the children of Israel, because you rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up to the Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments. Put them upon Eleazar his son, and Aaron shall be gathered to his people and die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded, and they went up into the Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments, put them on Eleazar his son, and Aaron died there in the top of the mount. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mount, and when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for Aaron. He got some mourning. <laughs> Thank God. Thirty days. Even all the house of Israel. You serve a God church who will water the people even when you disobey him. He'll give you notice that he's going to take you out and replace you and let you have a 30-day funeral. If God waters people even when you're in rebellion, he's not validating your life. He's validating his word. 
I need to go to the end. We're going to go back to verse 8. Because what I want to tell you is that God wants us today to speak to him. That's how I want to close today. In this scripture, we're seeing a picture, really, of Pentecost. What should have happened. You see, any time the saints, the people of God, uh, disobeyed him in the Old Testament, the severity of what Moses did is that he broke a type. And he altered a shadow. Okay? Because what was supposed to happen, the first time the rock was struck, was to be significant of Calvary. And the second time the rock was supposed to be spoken to, it was to be significant of Pentecost. And so God says, Moses, you have messed with something beyond your years. You have messed with something that was a part of my purpose. I cannot let you go into the promised land. It's too egregious. And what God was inspiring them to do at that point was to show them that God was not just a God who would, who would be uh, speaking to them through Ten Commandments and, and just giving Moses instruction and putting it in stone, but developing in the minds of the people that they had a God who could be addressed. <laughs> a God that you could talk to. A God who could hear the voices of people and respond in kind. They were so frightened of God because when they heard the thundering of his voice coming to Moses, they were like, mm, that's, that's too much for us. Moses, you take that and you tell us whatever God is saying. But they needed to see that the God that they serve is a God that can be addressed. He's a God that you can speak to in the time of your thirst. So while the Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in a prayer meeting that went 10 days. They were sending up the praises to God. They were praying and, and tarrying and waiting for God to work. Joel 2, 32 says that in that day it shall come to pass that whosoever shall do what? Call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Why? For in Mount Zion... And in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. That's salvation. As the Lord had said, and the remnant whom the Lord shall call. You'd be amazed. And I want to encourage us now as we close, keep the music down a little lower. Especially if we have to pray for people. I believe it's nice for people to hear the prayers that we're praying. What we're seeing across church is that sometimes the music is so loud and, and the singers are so loud, and I love it, I'm a worshiper. But the congregation isn't singing as much as they should. Maybe not in this church. <laughs> but the noise levels are so up, that, and, and we, have, we have turned the sanctuary into a stage. That's a modern thing. Because the ark would have been at the front, and we'd have all been facing it. But now we're, we're facing would have become performers. I'm not talking about this church. I'm just telling you the way things have been set up. And what it's done, it's caused people to stop calling. The silence in church sometimes is amazing. And the devil knows that the minute the believer starts to open their mouth, that he is in trouble. The Bible says that out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, God has ordained strength. Listen, before you leave here tonight, it's not just a shout I'm looking for. I'm telling you, there is something about addressing your God. This is what was hidden in this picture of the rock. That we had someone so strong and reliable and sturdy that if we just addressed him right, we could get everything that we need out of him. The woman with the issue of blood must have got a picture of this. When Jesus was passing by, she recognized that that rock that was following them through the wilderness was walking through town. And she said, if I can just touch him. And she was able to take virtue out of Christ, my God. He wasn't even focusing on her. You have a God. Who when he's not even looking in your direction. If you were dear to call upon the name of the Lord. You shall be delivered. Hallelujah. Oh you've got to believe that. 
You got to believe that when you call on the name of the Lord, there's something about it. There's something about the singing of the praises. The word of God said that the redeemed of the Lord shall return unto Zion with singing. Singing is important. Singing is a weapon. Paul and Silas uncovered this in the prison as they began to sing praises unto God. Amen. They, they found out about what the Bible called in the Psalms, songs of deliverance. God can give you songs to get you out. What does deliverance mean? Salvation. God gives songs that get you out of problems. God give you a song that gets you out of situations in the middle of your night season. When we say God give you a song, it's, it's not just something pretty to say. God can give you a song that gets you out. Oh, that's why the psalmist says, sing unto the Lord. Sing unto the Lord. Give unto the Lord glory. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory to his name. Speak to your rock. Stand to your feet tonight. We have a rock. You need to address your rock tonight. Speak to him. Ah, Pentecost wasn't a quiet moment. It wasn't a moment, church, where they sat there in what we come to term holy quietness. They called upon the Lord. That prophecy that we just highlighted in the book of Joel came after the promise that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh that's why we're here tonight God said this is my agenda I want to put my spirit in you the same spirit that was upon the fathers the Bible says and the same word that was in the mouth of the prophets God says I'm going to put it upon you and I'm going to give it to your children I love the fact that the word of God mentions young people it's a good thing he mentions young people because maybe we would have looked around and said maybe this isn't for young people. But he says, your young men shall see visions. Your, your young men will see visions. He says, I'll pour out my spirit on your sons. Your daughters. They will what? You're going to prophesy. Praise God. We want to see the manifestation of everything that God designed for the church to have. That's one of my prayers, Lord. Everything, every gift, every tool, every weapon, everything you designed for us to have, activate it in the church tonight. Activate it in my life tonight. How am I going to preach the gospel? By the power of the Spirit. How are we going to get victory? By the Holy Ghost working through us. Casting out devils. Many people want to be in a church that just blesses them. We need to be in a church where devils are cast out. We need to be in a church where sin is uncomfortable. We need to be in a church where the, the, the praise is alone. Sets the tone. There's a sound that comes from Zion. I heard it tonight, Pastor. Oh, I heard it tonight. While we were singing God's praises. While we were singing about the power of God. Singing about redemption, I felt the vibration, sir. I think I've been in so many places, and it, it seems like sometimes it's a bit of a plastic praise. But I, I thank God for the genuine move of God when we sing about redemption, when we sing about where He's brought us from. It's not for a show. Oh, glory to God. When we sing, we understand it's not just to be pretty, we recognize that songs are weapons. Mighty God. Songs put the enemy on the run. Songs set the stage for God to come down and to move in this place. Talk to your rock. Talk to your rock. Talk to your rock. Address your Savior. Praise God. He said, ask and it shall be given. Ask and it shall be given. Who wants a revival tonight? Who wants a renewal tonight? Who wants to be elevated tonight? Who wants their ministry to go to another level? You've been happy. It's been okay, but there's something missing. You want to move to a higher place. You want to move to new ground. Talk to the rock tonight. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on him. 
Vance table land, a higher place than I have found. Lord, plant my feet. Thank you, Lord. On high. Yeah. 